All right. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, we're going to start um, another uh, two talks before lunch, and then we'll have a 20-minute um, panel. Um, so up first, um, we're, we, we have a schedule change. Um, Timothy Sanders got delayed and will be, I think, speaking tomorrow. Um, so right now we have Nell Hardcastle, who's going to speak on Open Neuro and Data Lad. So Nell. Hello, everyone. Let me get this on the right screen. Uh, if it wants to cooperate. All right. <laughs> so, hello. Um, I'm Nell Hardcastle, a software engineer in the Paul Jack Lab at Stanford University. Um, I've been working on uh, the project I'm going to speak about today. Uh, open Neuro um, since 2017. Uh, there we go. All right. Uh, so the Open Neuro uh, is a web application, um, data archive uh, for the <laughs> free and open um, hosting of uh, neuroimaging data sets in a variety of uh, modalities now. Um, the archive uses the uh, BIDS dataset standard um, for formatting and structuring these datasets, uh, and recently passed the threshold of 1,000 datasets and uh, around 100 terabytes of data lad um, datasets uh, present on the archive. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the project first, um, and then sort of how the project, how the uh, archive functions. Uh, let me see if I can. All right, so um, the project began development in 2015 as the, su the uh, successor to the uh, open fMRI project, uh, which is an earlier um, archive of fMRI data. Uh, fMRI, uh, open fMRI was um, uh, manually curated um, data sets uh, following sort of the standard of the um, uh, Pull Jack Lab and related collaborators. Uh, and uh, that archive uh, data sets were frequently manually curated and um, the uh, uh, as far as collecting as many data sets as you can to improve the reproducibility of these data sets, uh, that was a barrier. Um, so one of the main ideas for uh, the creation of Open Neuro um, was the uh, idea that there would be this uh, validation tool um, and eventually the bid standard uh, providing the structure for these data sets um, and a way to automatically validate them before they are uploaded. Um, so Open Neuro um, spent its first couple years in development around this idea. Um, and uh, the first public version of Open Neuro was launched in 2017. So Open Neuro uh, 1.0, the launch that was the first public release, uh, was originally based around a backend um, built uh, by a flywheel called Cytran. Um, and uh, this is a Python framework uh, that has nothing to do with Git or Git Annex um, or Data Lad. And uh, so we're two years into our development history when, um, for a variety of reasons, we decided that we needed to um, <laughs> come up with something uh, different. Uh, the fork that we're using um, diverged and uh, from the upstream version produced by Flywheel, and uh, gradually uh, our version uh, was different enough that it was becoming a significant maintenance burden. Um, so we looked for this replacement model, and uh, we landed on Data Lad. <laughs> um, 
S3 exports uh, and the ability to provide downloads for data sets with common tools was uh, one of the main driving factors for making this uh, transition. And it took us a few months to build a prototype, which was initially constructed on top of the data lab code base. <laughs> um, and in 2018, uh, we released a, a complete version of OpenR 2.0 uh, that migrated all of our existing data sets from the previous backend into uh, data lab data sets. And uh, Open Arrow uh, uses a data model where data sets are Git Annex repositories um, with a small amount of data lab metadata. Um, these are structured, like I mentioned before, in uh, following the BIT standard. Uh, and we uh, version our data sets with Git tags. Um, following a semantic versioning scheme. These are created on OpenEarth's side so that we can assign DUIs to them before we generate a tag. And uh, OpenEarth differs from a number of projects in this space because it is a, uh, a web application with a number of components. Um, and uh, we're hosted entirely on the cloud. Uh, we have a React.js uh, web front end. That is the primary way that people interact with Open Arrow. Um, that client uh, speaks to a GraphQL API that's uh, developed on Node.js. Um, and the, uh, all of our Git operations are handled by um, horizontally scaled workers that uh, we have um, certain data sets assigned to certain workers. And this uh, allows us to, um, as usage and uh, demand on the archive changes, uh, we can add or remove workers as needed to, um, at uh, two levels, both the GraphQL API, we can add additional containers there, and also for the Git data sets themselves, we can add additional workers to scale those up and down. Uh, the site is currently hosted on Google Cloud Platform. Um, we are hosted entirely using Kubernetes, and our uh, infrastructure configuration, and all of the details about how our Kubernetes uh, system hosts the site um, are available in our Git repository on GitHub. <laughs> the division of concerns between these different components um, are uh, the API is responsible for the majority of uh, the concerns uh, outside of management of data lab data sets. Uh, the data lab data sets themselves are responsible. Uh, the worker, um, Git workers are responsible for that. Uh, the API does not have any access to a data lab data set directly. It always talks to the worker to determine um, information about a data set or uh, make changes to a data set. And this is just going over an example of sort of what a GraphQL query looks like um, on Open Arrow. Uh, we have a GraphQL Explorer that you can play around with um, to see sort of how queries work, and this includes some inline documentation um, for exactly how you would write a query uh, to access any sort of metadata related to a, a data set on Open Arrow. Um, and one thing I wanted to go over quickly with a query is uh, this provides an interface to the underlying uh, Git Annex data set itself. Um, and we do this by uh, reading into the repository for tree objects and presenting each tree object as its own uh, sort of subset of a given repository. So you make a request for the top level, you get these fields back with various files for this example uh, toy data set. <laughs> and this gives you back uh, 
that tree ID from the previous slide and you pass that in as an argument to the files uh, function in the query and that gets you the next level of the tree. And from there you can recurse down into various data sets, uh, various directories within a data set um, as needed for all the functions of Open Arrow. So, uh, we wanted uploads to be as simple as possible um, when we were initially developing Open Arrow, and uh, we built an uploader for the web um, prior to switching to Datalad. Um, and this was uh, set up so that users wouldn't need a lot of Git knowledge or um, any specific backend knowledge to be able to upload data sets to the archive. Uh, so there's command line tools and the web interface to upload a data set. Um, and uh, BITS validation uh, to ensure the data set follows the rules of BITS data sets happens on the client before you actually upload a data set. But this uploader uh, does not use, um, does not uh, directly interact with um, a Git uh, endpoint itself. This is just an HTTP uploader. You pass a number of files to the server, and then the server uh, generates a commit on the server side. Um, so this is sort of the flow of how this happens. Um, client requests a place to upload files. Uh, the client sits there posting all of its HTTP files to the server. And then once the server has received all of the files, it can generate a commit uh, with git annex add um, and git commit uh, on the server side. And that is how a new commit is generated within Open Arrow. Uh, we've always exported these data sets to GitHub, um, but that was primarily a means of making them as accessible as possible. Uh, we didn't have any way to bring data from GitHub back into Open Arrow. Um, and uh, if you wanted to, say, download a data set and uh, using Datalad and modify that data set, uh, you wouldn't be able to directly push those changes back to Open Arrow until 2021, where we added uh, support for uh, uploading via Git, direct Git interface. So. I was the slide behind. <laughs> uh, so for this, we have a uh, we have a credential helper for Git, and then we also have a Git Annex special remote. Um, so the credential helper is uh, uh, part of our Node.js command line tools that you use for uploading, and this also includes our um, Git Annex uh, special remote. So both of those tools are implemented within the same command line tool. Uh, the credential helper uh, allows um, for retrieving a JSON web token that allows uh, short-term access to a data set. We wanted to make sure that uh, these tokens, particularly if they're exposed, did not lead to uh, long-term access to data sets. So your long-term token issues you a short-term token that is used for each individual Git operation. Uh, there is a problem with this approach though sometimes, which is that uh, extremely large commits, such as those with hundreds of thousands of annexed files, uh, can take pretty significant server resources to generate. Uh, so we do queue these to some extent, but uh, there are situations where it's simply infeasible to generate a very large commit on the server side. Um, and it certainly has a cost. Uh, so, but there's, uh, so we'd like to expose Git more directly um, and allow users to generate commits um, on the client side and push those back to Open Neuro, which can be done right now with the interface that has existed since 2021 using 
uh, external tools, um, but we'd also like to be able to do this from the browser and also with our own command line uploader. Um, so thankfully, we have uh, prototyped this and implemented it on top of Dino, uh, which is a alternative to the Node.js runtime uh, that follows browser APIs. And uh, using isomorphic Git, uh, we've been able to support some of the features of Git Annex um, in the browser and also using Dino. Uh, none of the browser components are live on OpenNeuro yet. Uh, this is primarily for the command line tools, but the idea is to eventually generate commits on the client side, uh, regardless of if this is a command line tool or in the browser. Um, now, browser still has some limitations. Uh, you can't have uh, hundreds of gigabytes of files added to a browser process very easily. Um, but you can uh, work with a small number of annex files or a fairly large um, uh, data set repository um, <laughs> using this interface. Uh, the files themselves are temporarily stored in IndexedDB in the browser. Um, and then we have just a very basic implementation of this working with Dino. This is eventually going to replace the Node.js um, command line tool. Part of the motivation for doing this in Dino uh, is we also have a Dino bids validator that we would like to use uh, as part of this upload tool. And then a few <laughs> slides about some of the challenges that we've had with OpenNeuro. Uh, Besides just the size of these files, uh, scaling to a large number of Git objects has also uh, been an issue that we've run into. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about how to shard these data sets properly um, so that we can provide all the benefits of OpenNeuro uh, with uh, avoiding the limitations of having too many objects in a single Git repository. And also storage efficiency, OpenNeuro stores uh, multiple copies of uh, all of the Annex objects and all of the Git data that we have, um, besides exporting to S3, we also make backups. We have copies of this data uh, that are used on the workers for working with the data set itself. Um, and then uh, so, uh, The efficiency of storage for each data set is something that we are just really working to improve because that would improve the long-term sustainability of the archive. Uh, and some future plans. Uh, we'd like to make uh, forks available for data sets. Um, one of the challenges for that is uh, we, these workers have multiple file systems and we might have uh, annex files where we want to put a fork on a different worker um, but uh, the, there is some uh, need to uh, consider the storage efficiency when doing that um, while keeping those annex objects available when they're needed. Uh, and similarly, we'd like to have pull requests for data sets. Uh, these would probably exist outside of OpenNeuro, uh, but there would be some way to accept a pull request into your data set and the server process itself would handle merging those changes into your data set, including the annex files. And that's it. Thank you. I guess, does anyone have any questions? There's some minutes. Here we go. Um, do you have any routines to, okay, Git Annex, of course, it doesn't have bugs, but there could be surprises. <laughs> do you have any routines to validate correctness of, let's say, upload to S3, export to S3, you know, that everything is as good as it should? Uh, we do. Um, so we run, uh, we do re rely on Git Annex FSCK uh, mm -hmm. to check those remotes. Um, one of the ideas behind having the client generate commits is to be able to validate that the um, 
server and client copies are identical. And then uh, with FSCK, we can uh, check that the S3 copy also matches that. Um, does this FSEK check the content now, right? You have to download it. Um, we, we might want to talk, because with implementing specific chunking while upload, then ETAC will give you the desired checksum. Yeah, we do sure. that in Dandy Archive, and that helps a lot. Okay. Thanks, everyone.